can use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. There should be a little Q&A icon. You can click on that, type in your question, and when we get to the question and answers uh, portion of today's webinar, we will try and get through as many questions as time permits. Um, if you are having any technical difficulties, you can communicate with our moderator, uh, email Katherine Johnson at kjohnson at psrc.org. Her email was also included in the reminder email we sent out to folks. Um, and just as you may have already heard, this webinar is being recorded just to let people know. So with that, I am going to hand it over to our regional transit-oriented development advisory uh, committee co-chairs, Marty Koistra and Jay Arnold, to kick things off. Well, thank you, Laura. Um, we want to begin today um, by acknowledging that the central Puget Sound region is part of a larger area that has been the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples who lived here since time immemorial. These sovereign tribal nations enrich the region through environmental stewardship, cultural heritage, and economic development. The PSRC is making intentional efforts to create inclusive and respectful partnerships that honor indigenous cultures, histories, identities, and social political realities. We also would like to acknowledge the significance of today. This holiday marks the day in 1865 when in individuals enslaved in Texas were given the news of the Emancipation Proclamation and acted a year and a half earlier, eradicating American slavery. This day represents the ways in which freedom for black people have been delayed. It's a day to celebrate as well as a time to reflect on the racial injustices that continue to persist today and to take action. PSRC staff will provide a list resources to everyone who registered for this event after the meeting. Great. So thank you, Jay and Laura, for getting us kicked off. And we're excited to jump into uh, this webinar with all of you who have joined us today. We want to uh, first acknowledge the importance of the Regional TOD Advisory Committee it is the ongoing forum for all of the signatories of the GTC Compact. And we want to also thank the attendees and the panelists um, and the work of the PSRC staff as usual for making time for this important conversation to happen. Um, and we're glad we can still do this even though we're unable to meet in person. I just, I just want to share a couple of quick thoughts. Um, about the role of TOD and equitable communities. There is nothing more critical during this time when we approach the various pandemics that we're dealing with than our ability to make sure we right the wrongs of the past and foster equity in what we do. And that is why it's so important that we hone in and focus our attention on leveraging every potential opportunity that we have with our transit investments to make sure that we're creating livable communities where not only affordable housing is available, but all the aspects that allow for livelihood and vibrant life. And so this is just one more example today of how we are, as a community, trying to work hard to overcome some of the challenges of inequity and uphold opportunities for all people to be part of the Puget Sound region. Jay, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marty. As the high capacity transit network continues to expand across the region, TOD best practices continue to evolve. New stations present opportunities for better plans for equitable TOD and to ensure investment and development that benefits current and future residents. The focus of today's webinar uh, Sound Transit and Seattle, City of Seattle staff and community members will share information on work underway at Roosevelt Station, including community-led planning efforts and how lessons learned at Roosevelt can serve as a model for future TOD planning throughout the region. Our speakers today are Kristen Hoffman, Senior Project Manager for Sound Transit's Northgate Link Extension, who will talk about the planning, design, and construction of the station. Thatcher Imboden, Acting Director of Land Use and Development for Sound Transit. 
Jay Laserwitz, member of the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association, who will talk about the collaboration between the community and stationary development, and Laura Flemister from the City of Seattle's Office of Planning and Community Development, who will talk about the station area of planning that has taken place. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kristen to start our presentations. Thank you. Hold on, let me start my. All right, thank you for that. Uh, so Sound Transit is very excited to be here today to talk about the Roosevelt Station. Of course, we wish we could have taken you into the station, but um, we'll, we're dealing with the situation that we have today. So I just got the introductions of who is on the call here today with Sound Transit. Don Davis will hopefully be joining us. He is the executive director for Northgate Link. Um, I'm Kristen. I'm going to give the overview of the Roosevelt Station. And Mara is going to speak to um, the uh, DOD, both in general for Sound Transit, as well as specifically at Cedar Crossing, which is the TOD adjacent to the station. Abel Pacheco is on the call with us as well. And then Jay is going to speak a little bit about the community aspect of planning, design, and construction of the station and the TOD. And then the city will talk, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So the Northgate, Northgate Link Extension is a 4.3-mile light rail extension, and it goes from the University of Washington Station up to Northgate. The vast majority of the extension is underground. We have two underground stations, one at U District, which is at 43rd and Brooklyn, across the street from the University of Washington Tower. Then the Roosevelt Station, which is, we're specifically talking about today, which is at 65th and 12th in the heart of the Roosevelt neighborhood. And then the elevated station at North Gate. So it's on the east side of I-5 along First Avenue between 100th and 103rd. The, we are still on schedule to start in fall of 2021, so that's great. Um, and as you can see, we're expected to generate between 41 and 49,000 daily riders by 2022. I'm going to, I have a short video since we couldn't take you into the station. It's about a two minute video uh, walk through the station and I'll give a, um, I'll tell you what you're seeing as you're walking through it, and then we'll go back to the PowerPoint. So hold on just a moment while I switch screens. So this is the south entrance at 65th and 12th. We're going to descend the stairs. There's escalators to the left, to the mezzanine level. Those are escalators going down. They're right on the left. And to the front are stairs and escalators going up. These are the, our escalators. Just looking down into the station, down at the platform level. is also looking down you can see some of the interior art these are the stairs down we have stairs that go from ground level all the way to the platform in the station this is the stair landing so there's a lower landing um, for the stair run again this is looking down into the station at the platform level this is descending down to the platform we have art on both sides of the platform, it's a center platform. More images of the platform area. And again, those are the escalators. Those are the escalators running from that first mezzanine all the way down to the platform. This is up at the north entrance. 
just looking back down uh, to the south. And this is the north entrance out at 67. And this is at 66. We have a bike area on the north side of uh, 66. So this is a the project timeline for the Roosevelt Station for this is a typical timeline for all sound transit light rail stations. Essentially, you have to plan, plan the project, design it, and then construct it before obviously you can open service. And in all of these phases, public involvement is critical to sound transit and so um, to our success. Specifically for the Roosevelt Station during the, uh, all three of these phases, the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association has been a key uh, group that sound transit has involved and the RNA has um, has been very involved in the, the planning, design, and construction of the station. It was during the planning phase that actually there were a couple alternatives of where the station could be. One was at the western edge of the, the Roosevelt Commercial Core, and it was actually the RNA lobbying both Sound Transit and the city to move the station into the heart of their commercial core, which is why it's now at uh, I was constructed at 65th and 12th. And so just involving the community, working with them, um, it, it's been very successful during for the Roosevelt Station and, and Sound Transit feels it's a model of how we move forward with other stations. During the design phase, that's when the, the design of the extension, including the specific stations is finished as well as uh, the art. We have two commissioned artists in the, for the Roosevelt Station, an exterior artist and an interior artist. Land use permits and property acquisition are also part of uh, this process, as well as, again, bringing the designs out to the public to get feedback. Um, we also involved the Roosevelt businesses and uh, specific to the Roosevelt neighborhood, the Roosevelt High School. So we tailor and work with the stakeholders that are in you know, the specific areas. During construction, uh, of course that's pretty uh, self-explanatory, but that's when obviously all the, the construction is done. And so the outreach here and the public involvement is uh, for Sound Transit, letting the community and the nearby property owners and business owners know what sort of activities are going on, um, what kind of, if there's night work or, you know, weekend work, just keeping them informed and, um, and listening to any concerns they have about what, what we're doing and how it's impacting them. This is a overall schedule for Northgate Link. So these timelines that you'll see won't uh, match up exactly with the Roosevelt Station, the slide before, since that slide was specific to Roosevelt Station and this is, for the whole extension that you can see we're here at the middle of 2020 we're um, we're almost done and about to open service so what the phase that we're in right now is down here the systems installation and then the testing um, but you can see how long final design um, for our particular extension I, the, the tunneling was a, a large portion of our um, project schedule and then the station construction goes. So we are on track to open in fall of 2021. So specifically for Roosevelt, so here's a map over here of um, the Roosevelt area. So this is 65th Street, north is up on this image. I-5 is over to the far left. And this is the station. Uh, there's two station head houses, there's an entrance a south entrance at 65th and 12th, and then a north entrance at 67th uh, and 12th. And here's the high school, Roosevelt High School. Again, it's an underground station. Our, we have a lot of bike parking, and primarily it's here on the north side of 66th. We have a plaza, a large plaza on the north side, and a smaller plaza on the south side. 
There's a site plan of the Roosevelt Station, so north is now to your right. The this street down here is 12th Avenue. And here's 65th, the major arterial through the community. Here's the south entrance at 65th and 12th. This is the lobby area. And then through the video, you saw we descended down the stairs. There's escalators. There's an elevator over here. And then we have an art plaza outside. On the north side, the north entrance is over here on 67th. North entrance, again, uh, elevator in the corner, escalator and stairs along the east side of, of the station, and then a larger plaza uh, just to the south of the north entrance. These light blue parcels are our future TOD parcels, and it's this large parcel between 66, 66th and 67th adjacent to the North Head House that Mara is going to talk about here in a few moments. This is just a section cut through of the station. Hopefully, uh, since you saw the video now, it, you can maybe kind of see how you were descending. So we entered, um, we entered over here on 65th, which is on the left side of the screen, went through the lobby entrance, came down the escalade, or actually we came down the stairs. Here's the, the first mezzanine landing. The escalators run down here, uh, angular in the back, all the way down to the platform. The stairs, because you can't have that one of run with the stairs, the stairs we have a, a little stair landing here with stairs again going all the way down. And then again, here's the north, uh, sorry, yeah, the north entrance on the right, 67th Street. And you can tell from this section the grade differentiation, there's about a 20 foot grade difference between 65th on the left and 67th on the right. So I think through this section, you're, you're better able to see that grade change. And then here's just a few station photos. These should look a little bit familiar. Um, so the image in the top left is again, the south entrance. The standard radio sign is uh, taken from a building that was at the south entrance that Sound Transit had to demolish to make way for the station. We deconstructed the facade of that building. It's an art deco, kind of art deco facade, and we reincorporated it into the station entrance. The upper right photo is of the north entrance. You're looking north out of the station. The lower left photo is at the uh, mezzanine level looking down into the station. Again, it's a center platform, so the trains are on either side. And then the lower right hand corner photo is at the platform. And I think with that, that's the end of my part of the presentation. I'll hand it over to Mara for her to talk about TOD. Thank you. This is Thatcher M. Bowden. I'm Acting Director of Land Use Planning and Development for Sound Transit. I am joined by Mara D'Angelo, our Senior Project Manager who managed the TOD project for Sound Transit. Uh, I believe many people are familiar uh, with our TOD program, so I'm going to try to keep things fairly brief as an overview of the program and then hand it over to Mara who will talk more about uh, Roosevelt specifically. Next slide. Um, Okay, perfect. Uh, our equitable TOD policy was adopted in 2018 and includes goals that uh, you typically see in a TOD policy, but it also, or su such as uh, supporting local and regional growth plans, increasing ridership and access, and using agency property to create TOD. Uh, however, in 2018, we really pushed further to, um, you know, advance equity and really focused on a number of different uh, kind of aspects of that, specifically elevating TOD planning within the transit planning process. Uh, expanding our engagement efforts to bring in community voices earlier and throughout the planning process and to commit to reaching uh, those marginalized and underrepresented in the planning process. And additionally, it prioritized using sound transit surplus property for affordable housing and other equitable development outcomes. Next slide. Now on the ground, uh, that's a policy that's pushing for transit projects to be more intentional about how uh, we design our transit facilities that supports local efforts to shape the physical community. Uh, around the station, but also that it, you know, avoids having um, 
the agency creating non-developable remnant properties around our stations. And instead, we try to be uh, forthright in creating TOD opportunities. Mark, can you make sure the next slide is advanced? It also looks like an agency uh, creating many affordable housing development opportunities and, and doing that in partnership with affordable housing funders and other partners to increase the certainty and speed of its creation. It also looks like the agency identifying opportunities for joint development uh, where we could potentially have shared infrastructure, air rights development, or alternative delivery of transit, transit project components that are integrated with the development. Uh, I'll go back a slide, please. Are many of you are likely familiar with our 80-80-80 statute that applies uh, to our surplus property portfolio. The statute uh, provided Sound Transit with a tool to discount property to create affordable housing, which was not something uh, that the agency could do until ST3 passed. It's known as 80-80-80 uh, because Sound Transit is required under law to first uh, offer at least 80% of our surplus properties that are suitable for the development of housing to these qualified entities to develop affordable housing. And that uh, should they accept the property, at least 80% of the units that are constructed on it must be affordable at, at least 80% or 80 of area median income or below, uh, thus the 80-80-80. And a qualified entity is defined as a local government, a housing authority, or a nonprofit developer. And in those conditions, we can now discount property to help facilitate the development of, of housing. And as many of, of you are familiar uh, you know, with, with land, uh, prices going up um, across the region, but also very specifically in uh, transit station areas because of the increased access that transit provides, uh, creating affordable housing near transit stations has become increasingly difficult. And so the ability of um, kind of uh, making the property acquisition costs uh, less to facilitate affordable housing uh, outcomes is, is critically important to be able to realize uh, that outcome. Uh, Next slide. Real quick, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of what Sound Transit has done with its uh, surplus properties. Next slide. Sound Transit has had over 300 units of affordable housing constructed on its surplus property to date, and that was all done prior to us having the ability to discount property. Uh, they range in, in location uh, from uh, the Federal Way Transit Center to Mount Baker, Othello Plaza, and at the next slide, uh, our first uh, building at Capitol Hill Station, the station house development that Capitol Hill Housing uh, opened actually in March of this year with 110 units. Next slide. Additionally, we have over 700 uh, units of housing that are currently under construction. That includes 318 units that are still uh, yet to open at Capitol Hill. Uh, they're the market rate components of that project. Uh, about 100 and a um, little over 130 units at Beacon Hill Station, which is uh, a development that is primarily constructed on private property and, and incorporated about 2,000 uh, square feet of uh, what was a remnant property at uh, Beacon Hill. And then the project we're gonna be talking more in, in detail in a moment, which is the Cedar Crossing project at Roosevelt Station, which is the first uh, project under 808080 uh, and the first discounting of property, uh, which will create over 254 units of affordable housing at Roosevelt. And then next slide. Uh, we also have a 450 units of affordable housing uh, that are currently um, we've awarded to development partners um, and that they're designing and hoping to construct uh, you know first hill starting later this year and uh, the atlas site which is in capitol hill uh, in next year and then the last i'm going to talk a little bit about um should we can go to the next slide uh, Perfect. Um, during the implementation process, like how does Sound Transit, um, you know, move from having this, you know, potential development opportunity to having a, a building open and with people being able to move into new homes? And that's really kind of divided into three different phases. The defined phase where we're really looking to identify what is the opportunity and defining the priorities uh, on how that property gets redeployed. And then the partnering phase, which is both about resource alignment. So if we're trying to achieve uh, equitable outcomes, even a property discount often is not enough to realize it. And so we must partner, uh, either the developer must partner or we must partner, or in some cases both must partner uh, with other uh, government agencies or philanthropic entities to realize those outcomes. 
but it's also about partnering with a development partner uh, who is going to be responsible for uh, really taking kind of the priorities and turning it into a project and they will take it through the design process the finance and permitting and then ultimately construct uh, the development during the realized phase uh, in some cases when sound transit has uh, property that is uh, adja immediately adjacent to our facilities uh, or integrated with our facility sound transit has a much stronger role in terms of monitoring the project during that phase and um, I, I highlight that because the roosevelt project is is um, something that is built right next to our facilities and same with Capitol Hill and Beacon Hill, and it takes a lot of effort uh, to both realize that as an outcome in terms of the design coordination, um, but also just the sensitivity around constructing there. So it takes a lot of effort on the part of Sound Transit, uh, as well as our development partner and their design teams. And so we've been working to try to uh, learn from each of these experiences to try to help uh, expedite uh, the development process, remove as many risks as possible for both uh, entities, uh, and make sure that the outcomes are, are best for the community. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Mara, who will talk uh, about Roosevelt. Thanks, Thatcher. Um, so now that Thatcher's provided some background on our program overall, I'm going to um, give an overview of the TOD project at Roosevelt Station specifically. So Kristen touched on this, but um, it's about 1.2 acres adjacent to the Roosevelt Station North Head House. Um, and uh, transit will open for service in fall of 2021. The Cedar Crossing TOD project will open in 2022 and it will be developed by Bellwether and Mercy and provide more than 250 affordable housing units. Um, because the TOD project will be built adjacent to, although not touching the station building, uh, we knew that there would be some special considerations. Um, so this slide is just touching on the fact that we had to work closely with uh, Bellwether and Mercy to ensure their construction wouldn't threaten the structural integrity of our head house building um, and that the buildings wouldn't create any operational or safety concerns on either side. So. For instance, we needed to spend time reviewing Cedar Crossing shoring plans to make sure their work wouldn't undermine our station building or affect the railway in any way. And then at the same time, Cedar Crossing's daycare facility has outdoor space on the side of the building that faces our station wall. Um, and so, you know, we, we also had conversations about making sure we were able to give um, them notice if we needed to come in between the buildings and uh, do some maintenance work on our station uh, wall. So that's kind of the nature of having these buildings so close to one another. Um, this slide's here because we just wanted to take a moment to note that these projects take time. Um, during the station design process, as early as 2010, we started talking about the potential opportunities for TOD at this property. Um, and it wasn't until 2017 that we were really at a point where we could begin engaging with the community to start shaping the direction that the TOD project would take. And then after going through the RFP process and finalizing all of our agreements, um, Construction uh, began a few months ago and it'll be complete in 2022. So our program continues to try to work to make this timeline as efficient as possible, but we have to put a lot of forethought in um, to try and line up the opening of a project like this with a station opening, which is um, kind of our ideal outcome for a TOD project. Um, we also wanted to touch on the fact that we undertook an equitable engagement process around the TOD project, and Jay is going to really talk more about that. But um, through that process, RNA helped us arrive at a set of goals that we incorporated into the project ultimately, and those goals included a significant amount of affordable housing, and it led us to partner with the City of Seattle's Office of Housing to issue a joint RFP here that included both a property discount from Sound Transit and a commitment of funds from the city for the project. Um, with these types of projects, Sound Transit's board typically approves a set of key business terms. Um, so for this project, our board approved terms including the production of two, 230 or more 100% affordable housing units, at least 12,000 square feet of retail space, and um, Sound Transit providing that discounted sale price to help make the project work. 
Um, these are some of the highlights associated with the Cedar Crossing project. Um, the FTA was a great partner on this project and we used the Federal Joint Development Program to help implement it. Um, this was our first property that Sound Transit discounted under the state 808080 policy that Thatcher um, went through um, in order to achieve an affordable housing outcome here. And then uh, the developers were also able to partner uh, um, with El Centro de la Raza to create a daycare space here, um, which will be a great asset for the community and the project. Since we weren't able to go on a, a, a real tour, I just wanted to include a picture of what construction looks like at the TOD site. This is a couple of weeks ago, an aerial view of what's happening there. Um, and then this is a rendering of what the project will ultimately look like um, and a few other kind of views of the different sides of the project just so you can get a sense of, um, of where it will be in the end. <laughs> um, and that's it for our portion. This is Laura Benjamin again. I think we're going to pause for just a moment because I know with Thatcher, um, another commitment, it needs to leave a little bit early. Um, I'm not seeing any questions coming through the Q&A function at this time. Um, so I think we can move on to Jay's presentation or talk if that works for folks. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, starting with some history, Roosevelt's a very small neighborhood severed from the larger Green Lake area due to the imposition of I-5 in the 1960s. Uh, the urban village designation uh, comprises the entire neighborhood centering around the intersections of Northeast uh, 65th Street and Roosevelt Way Northeast. It's close to the station, the new station location. The key to maximizing support for housing and strong pedestrian character is the station location. Throughout the history of the RNA uh, and the Roosevelt community, there's been strong civic uh, participation. After the Sound Transit Board decided to locate a station in Roosevelt in the early 2000s, the Roosevelt community, under the leadership of Jim O'Halloran, pushed for the station location to be placed within the central business area, step along I-5. My own history includes being a member of the Light Rail Review Panel in the early 2000s, seeing the evolving support for shifting the station to the current central neighborhood spot, this being a catalyst for increased housing development. Over time, there's been a lot of different neighborhood civic engagement and advocacy that supported the TOD. During the 2010-2011 zoning changes, the Roosevelt community supported more increased density due to the acceptance of TOD and also to reduce density elsewhere where there were some critical concerns. We welcome the density, though needed to bridge neighborhood issues with future density. Another aspect of our community engagement were a series of what we called Land Use Academy sessions, initiated by Jim O'Halloran and myself and others on various topics starting in 2015, 2017. Uh, the first was our history, kind of how we got to now past plans and the recent uh, neighborhood design guidelines at that time. Uh, the second was planning, what issues are important to future development. Uh, third was the Roosevelt Reservoir, what might happen if that property was surplused and Lastly, most importantly, TOD, what will take place on the Sound Transit site. And we did that, I think, in the fall of 2016. So all the events that we did and subsequent surveys and information were important to laying a groundwork for the TOD redevelopment. The RNA applied for and received an Enterprise Community Partners grant in 2016 to study the TOD site, engaging planning and development consultants integral to our team to define the community goals. We were invited by Sound Transit to partner and co-organize the community workshops in early 2017. This was a benefit to Sound Transit in that the outcomes would be vetted and supported by the community. And then for the RNA, we were able to garner the Sound Transit resources to support the community workshops 
instill our concerns into the process and push for a wider and more issue-oriented outcomes. I think planting the information seed early and providing ongoing resources to community groups is critical to understanding the benefits of TOD, defining community needs, and affordable housing adoption. The resulting community principles were well-crafted and written by the entire community. These focused on 100% affordable housing, integrated childcare, strong pedestrian character, and maximizing street-level commercial uses. These were wholly supported by the community adopted by Sound Transit into the RFP and for the redevelopment of the Roosevelt site and became the core criteria for the final selection of the development team. Additionally, I was trusted as the first community participant in the formal RFP selection process. I hope that this will be a model for all future RFP project selection efforts for TOD as it further engenders the community in the long-term goals and as public supporters for other TOD projects. Some of the lessons we learned, early study and research is important, laying the groundwork for the community to understand issues as we did with the Land Use Academy sessions. Working together, making partners with Sound Transit, elected officials, housing providers, and funders is important. The ongoing community outreach that, that we all did the community workshops with direct connectivity produced by the community and major partners, in this case, Sound Transit, was greatly rewarding. The follow through, the incorporation of the community principles into the RFP, and also the final selection process. We asked for street level commercial use, and that was a big ask as the housing monies uh, cannot be spent on uses other than directly for housing and required a separate commercial condominium structure which we deem necessary for this site. And lastly, by making, uh, by supporting 100% affordable housing, the Sound Transit Board was able to offer the site a below market rate due to the exemptions written into the FTA guidelines that govern this process. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Jay. So it looks like we do actually have a few questions for Thatcher and Mara, if they are still with us. Uh, so the first question is, who is the architect for the Cedar development? Sorry, Via. Great, thank you. And then the second question was, um, can you please mention again, how many of the units are affordable and at what income levels? <laughs> Sorry, Thatcher, do you want me to? Um, it, it's, I believe it's 254. Um, and they're uh, affordable to 60% of AMI and below. Fantastic, thank are, you. Yeah, there are units at, um, below 60% in there. I don't, I don't have the final count on that. But it was a, I think it's also worth noting that, you know, one of the community's priorities and I think opportunities uh, that was identified during the engagement process was trying to include a significant amount of, of larger size units uh, to take advantage of the the school, the nearby schools, it's you know a block from uh, Roosevelt High School as an example, and so uh, one of the community's priorities was maximizing the number of families that could potentially live in the building, and so the project includes a significant amount. I think it's about a third of the units uh, that are sized either two or three bedroom, and so there's a uh, a variety of different kind of strategies that are being deployed uh, at the building to kind of reach. Uh, both reach uh, different populations um, and different AMI levels. So obviously while you're talking, this is generating more questions. We got another one. Um, does the Roosevelt neighborhood now fully support the station and related TOD? That might partly be a J question as well. Yeah, what I've heard is we have a enormous uh, support for, well, for the station 
and for the Cedar Crossing project and the affordable housing. I think there were some concerns early on that uh, it, it might look like a different structure if it was 100% affordable, but we're really pleased to see it's going to be a real keystone structure. Uh, so everybody I've talked to is really excited about the project. Fantastic. I'm just quickly looking. The, ah, here we got one more question. What is the amount of parking being provided for the project? I'd have to look that back up. Um, it's a very low um, percentage. Uh, you know, the the sites. The interesting thing about parking is that you know I think site design and then location have a huge impact on how much parking you build. And in this case, uh, the site has a uh, grade change across it. And so, um, in order to, so it's kind of like a walkout floor. And so, a part of um, the ground level, the lowest level of the building, um, kind of behind uh, some storefront uh, and building lobbies, they were able to, during the excavation process, include some parking. It's never been a, a key driver, I think, in either the community goals, in the city's priorities as it relates to their funding, or in the developer's proposal. And so I'd have to confirm it's you know 50 stalls or 70 stalls, something like that. I can't. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I I have down fewer than 75. Um, I know Elisa from Mercy Housing is also on the call, so Elisa, feel free to type if you need to correct us about anything. But yours fewer than 75 is what I. And again, I think the key to me, the the takeaway here is that uh, it's, you know, the affordable housing funders don't necessarily want to fund uh, parking instead of housing. The community wanted this building to be uh, pedestrian oriented and not be oriented towards the automobile as a specific priority. And the developer didn't feel that you know any more parking than was absolutely necessary was was needed. And so I think you know the the zone between the zoning code, the financing components, the market, uh, and you know the community and the developer, everybody kind of aligned there to try to make sure that. Um, you know, the parking was kind of as minimal as needed. And again, because of the site design and the, the slope across the site, I, you know, my, my suspicion is that they, you know, created the amount of uh, parking that is, um, you know, the design kind of allowed for, uh, but we have a different project in First Hill that only has like four stalls uh, for like 300 plus units. So it, it really kind of depends on location and um, size of the site as well. Great, thank you. Well, we are still continuing to get questions in and we do encourage attendees to keep submitting your questions, although I think these questions are some of the other panelists and a little bit more high level. I know we wanted to have questions specific uh, for Thatcher's presentation while we still had him. So I think unless I see anything coming else in, which I'm not, um, I think we're ready to move on to the next presentation, which I believe is Lauren. Thank you. Okay, I'm just waiting to send my video here. Okay, great. Let me share my screen. So good morning, everyone. My name is Lauren Flemister. I work for the City of Seattle in the Office of Planning and Community Development. I'm the Community Planning Manager, and I manage community planning and station area planning. So I really want to talk about this through the lens of kind of um, how we can learn from Roosevelt as we move into starting to plan for Sound Transit 3 stations, particularly at West Seattle Ballard. So it's really through the lens of um, lessons learned and new opportunities for how we approach the planning process, particularly, I think, from a um, design guidance uh, standpoint. So really looking at um, design review um, and things like that. 
I should actually not say design review. My SDCI friends will be upset with me. Um, really looking at project review for um, the light rail stations and then uh, the surrounding areas. <clears throat> so a lot of this was already covered, so I'm not going to belabor um, what's already been covered by Jay Thatcher and Mara and others. Um, so I think, you know, from a sort of urban design and context understanding, you know, this is a, originally a streetcar neighborhood. So we have these sort of really nice organic mix of uses. Um, we have a nice mix of housing types. Um, and it's a really engaged, excuse me, it's a really engaged neighborhood. So um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's an ideal place to um, introduce light rail. So I'm not going to really go over this because it was already covered. We already talked about the station site development, and um, we already talked about the agency TOD, so I'll just move through that. Let me talk a little bit about, about the rezone. So um, the city initiated um, at about a half-mile area a rezone, um, and we did it about nine years before the station opened. So obviously there's the idea of trying to think about sort of market readiness and, and uh, indicating to the market what's going to be possible. So, you know, like with all rezones, um, they tend to be fairly controversial, particularly when you're talking about up zones. Um, you know, what you tend to have is sort of when you start talking about higher density, um, it suggests obviously significant change, um, particularly in, in this neighborhood um, around Roosevelt High. Um, but then conversely, you have, you know, urbanists wanting larger zoning increases. So there's this there's this tension. Um, so what ended up happening was um, sort of a negotiation where we placed higher density zoning to the west, um, away from larger contiguous contiguous areas of single family. So I think that's generally what the compromise tends to be in situations like this. Um, so kind of protecting the Ravenna uh, neighborhood to the east. Um, but what we did see in this rezone is something of a building boom. Um, so it kind of, it's kind of transformed um, the area immediately around the station. Um, so this early rezone um, allowed for redevelopment to happen before the station opened. So I think kind of a, a not ideal situation as the station opens and then there's like nothing that's happened. So um, I think um, that's something that we're obviously wanting to carry forward into ST3. We want to see a fair amount of development occurring before and at the time of station opening. Um, at this time, I believe there's about 1,500 new um, housing units that have been added to this area. So I think um, I think this has already been touched on a little bit, but I think what the downside is is um, the affordability question and the housing mix question. So a lot of these units are uh, trending towards the sort of the, the luxury market, and they're small size. So um, you're not getting those family size unit units, which is a consistent problem. I mean, throughout the United States, it's not particular to station areas or Seattle. Um, and then of course you have some affordable units. Um, so and that's, um, it's also important to know this happened before MHA, even though with MHA, it still wouldn't um, create the number of affordable units that um, would be needed. So I'm kind of moving um, to the lessons learned framing a little bit more particularly. Um, kind of really understanding the benefits um, of early transit-oriented development, really looking at planning early for co-development and thinking about um, right-of-way design, both early and um, kind of a little bit later, um, since sort of um, needs and desires change, particularly around right-of-way, a little bit closer to, to a station open. Um, always um, early and continued community engagement is really, really important. Um, and then additionally, thinking about interim controls, so making sure you're not getting development um, 
of the quality and type that is not appropriate for station areas and then also um, thinking about equitable transit oriented development. I know Sound Transit has their policies and, and program, but also from the city's viewpoint, thinking about community ownership um, and uh, more robust community involvement and in what happens um, around transit oriented development, um, both immediately in the station area and in, in um, and in the broader station area, so the, the walk shed area. So I just want to drill into this a little bit more, um, particularly around community engagement and equitable transit rate and development. So, um, you know, building capacity with community groups, figuring out ways to involve them in decision making and being clear what those decisions actually are, um, trying to involve um, community in design at all stages in the process. So really, um, from you know five, you know ten, fifteen percent all all the way through uh, to ninety, um, and then understanding and advocating um, for decisions to be um, pushed back um, if it's too early to meaningful engage with communities. So this is already happening on West Seattle Ballard, where we're trying to understand um, what the touch points are with community and um, trying to make sure that we're phasing it to where the, the conversations um, are meaningful and not also not feeling pressure to have the conversations, for example, while we're still um, entertaining multiple options. Maybe you ask the question once for one alternative instead of asking the question multiple times for multiple alternatives. Um, and then I kind of mentioned- In my work where we've considered- I mentioned interim controls already. Um, and then early planning for equitable transit oriented development. So thinking about things like um, value capture, um, thinking about um, not displacing folks, and then um, community driven development, as I mentioned before. And then in terms of design, um, thinking about how do we center racial equity, um, thinking about creating places um, that are um, about um, community pride, civic pride. Um, something that we've been thinking a tremendous amount about is sort of the wraparound user experience. So, you know, from, you know, swiping your card to getting on the train to walking into the plaza, what is the, the complete user experience going to be like and how can design impact that? Um, movement and modal balance. So obviously we have people um, maybe who are biking or walking to the station. Um, how does space, um, how is space designed to make sure that um, it's easy for bikers or walkers um, to properly engage with light rail? Um, so thinking also about the rider basics and also amenities. Um, and then also um, always sustainability and adaptability. Okay, so um, we've already seen the site plan before, but um, just in terms of, uh, you know, kind of thinking about what we can learn from the station, um, we need to start focusing more on ancillary uses, understanding where blank walls are along a streetscape, thinking about transparency um, along our frontages. Um, I already mentioned this just a little bit, but prioritizing pedestrians, um, prioritizing bikers, and then also thinking about the bus transfer environment. So where are these, um, where are the bus stops? How are people um, able to safely get off the bus, maybe cross the street or use sky bridges, whatever. Um, and so how do you kind of safely have this mix of modes and people able to move through a station site? Um, so more integrated street design um, to extend the public realm is really big. So thinking about um, how sidewalks and streets are a part of that overall um, user experience. So kind of thinking about our future design refinements and things that we're gonna be focusing on um, as um, we start to work on design um, guidelines and development standards. So, you know, basic things like building form. So, 
you know, scaling visual prominence, thinking about wayfinding, which is obviously always a really huge thing. Um, obviously, Seattle being a city where tourism is important, everyone's not going to um, innately know where things are. So how do we help people find their way? Um, I already mentioned civic and community pride. Something else that's really interesting is and really important is um, public art. How do we integrate art early to help set the tone and help shape and inform design? Again, I already mentioned blank walls. Um, materiality is always really important. Um, legibility, so sort of being able to read and understand this is a station, this is an entrance, um, things of that nature. Um, cultural expression um, is also extremely important. And then I already um, alluded to um, thinking about public space and adjacent right of way. Um, so something else I think that's um, always been important, but I think has, it's underscored um, by what's going on right now, how incredibly important it is to closely collaborate with communities of color um, in our station areas to work towards creating um, stations that feel welcoming to all and create a sense of belonging for all. So um, kind of thinking again about um, more specific design guidance um, as we look at some of our built stations, um, obviously Roosevelt here, I'm thinking about um, depth head and sort of understanding how people um, perceive and feel safe. So thinking about things like sight lines, making sure that um, equipments aren't obstructing our sight lines, that there's visual interest. Um, so making platforms um, immersive with color, thinking about our lighting, um, materials on all of the surfaces. Um, something, of course, that's incredibly important is how does this work for um, folks of all abilities, how does it work for families? Um, again, art as an integrated element, I think there's definitely some features at the Roosevelt stations that, station that does that do that, but um, it being sort of more integrated throughout the entire process, as I alluded to earlier. Um, again, how do we invite community to have more of a say in what their user experience is like, both from sort of the aesthetic to the performative? Um, and um, features that um, visually announce arrival at each station, and it should be unique to each station. There should be visual, visual cues. So whether it's specific colors or specific, specific art pieces or the way something is lit. Okay, and with that I'll end my presentation. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, so we have now entered into the Q&A portion of our webinar. Um, so I will ask the presenters who are still with us, um, stop sharing your screens, but if you are able to turn your video on um, and turn your audio on as questions come up, um, so I will read questions out loud and I will also post them so presenters should be able to see them. Um, so first question, um, from the perspective that well-designed public space will contribute to the success of a station area, how much attention and emphasis has been placed on the role and design of public plazas, both at the light rail station and for each of the TOD projects? This is Kristen. I can start with at the for the station. So having gatherings to uh, the design of the station, as I pointed out in the site plan. Uh, so the station entrances are on 65th and 67th, and then there's 66th in the middle. And so we grouped the open space around there creating on the south side of 66, the smaller, more intimate space, 
I didn't point it out when I was showing the site plan, but that's where the exterior art is. There's a, a big sculpture, it's called Building Blocks. And it's a more, like I said, kind of smaller, intimate space. And then on the north side is a much larger gathering space. And I know the in working with the Roosevelt Neighborhood Association, they did want, you know, kind of public gathering space was something that was important to them. And so we were able to create a bigger area on the north side of 66. I'd like to um, answer this kind of um, moving forward as well. Um, I think it's a really important question. So I think um, the city's stance is that, of course, it's incredibly important. I think Sound Transit probably shares um, this opinion about the importance of, of public space um, from the sort of user experience vitality standpoint. Um, so, you know, our sense is that. Um, there will be um, there will be design guidelines that um, regulate and inform both the plazas at the station and at the TOD projects. But I think something else that's um, happening that I think is um, should be applauded is that um, Sound Transit and the city have a co-planning process where um, through the earliest design phases, so really through the planning phases, we're collaborating and talking about what's possible. Um, around each station, um, both um, just at the station and in the one to two block radius right outside of the station. And so um, I think it'll um, create almost um, sort of a best practice and um, project exemplars for what we would hope would happen beyond um, that immediate um, context area. I'd like to add some some thoughts too from the community that um, we push for some increased setbacks along the south side of the project along Northeast uh, 66th Street, which is designated as a as a green street, meaning a kind of a multimodal pedestrian street. And there's some large steps that go uh, up to a plaza. We also ask in the community to workshops for kind of a pass through, but it's somewhat of a larger, or wider block. And it turns out that that's that's really that's where the residential entries are going to be, and there's also going to be a, a public use kind of community space within the building. That pass through also conveniently uh, kind of separates the the whole development into kind of two structures, uh, which was also the way that the tax credits were kind of separated too in terms of four percent and nine percent monies. So we're really excited about that, uh, both the uh, large steps to be able to sit on and face south and the, the public, uh, kind of the pass through and the space up, up uh, above the plaza. Thank you. Great. Well, before we move on to our next question, a quick follow up from the earlier questions was, um, thank you to Alyssa for chatting with me and letting me know that there are 75 stalls as part of the development that Thatcher and Mara were discussing, and a portion of those are related to the retail on site. So thank you for that information. All righty, moving on to the next question. Post this so folks see it. What can be done to reduce risk and uncertainty and to expedite the process. Um, and I think this probably could relate to both everything from design to land acquisition to how you want to take that um, is up to you. But thoughts on what can be done to reduce risk and uncertainty and to expedite the process. I'll um, take a, a first crack at that. I think um, I just alluded to the co-planning, so I think early cooperation um, sort of across agencies, but also with community. So I think um, from a standpoint of, um, of agencies, um, thinking about not only land acquisition, but also the permitting process, um, 
also the environmental review process, I think um, it tends to work better um, if you lay out your cards on the table early. Obviously, you can't know everything um, at the outset, but you know a lot. And you also know where pitfalls have occurred in the past. And so I think um, being clear on what hasn't worked in previous processes, um, coming to the table together to work through how it can be modified and changed, and talking about things um, as early as possible. So when you're at, you know, 0% design, 5 and 10% design, you're constantly sitting down together and working through things can help. Um, from the community side, I think, um, you know, one of the biggest risks and uncertainties is things like appeals. But if you engage folks early and share what you know with folks early and give them a chance um, to understand um, what the project is, but also how they can impact the process, I think it lowers the risk um, of late breaking appeals or concerns from communities. So I think um, transparency, participation, and being able to, excuse me, being willing to roll up your sleeves and work through hard things um, at the earliest point possible are some of the things that can be done. We're trying to do that now. I'm, I'm kind of curious to see um, as we move through environmental review where we end up um, with West Seattle Ballard, you know, and um, right now, 2023. Um, if we're able to work through a lot of the kinks and um, hopefully then permitting would work smoothly. I'm very curious um, if all the work we're doing up front um, helps, helps alleviate some of the pressure with permitting later. I would, um, I would agree with Lauren. Oh, I was to say, I, I would agree with Lauren that I think, um, you know, the permitting aspect is a very lengthy aspect so i think if you you can engage with the permitting agencies uh early on and you know see see if within that phase that um things can be more streamlined or you know how you can how you can move the process that there aren't late changes um, to permitting requirements in the design process that happened uh, on definitely at U District. Um, so I think you know that just kind of getting everything out in the beginning, or like Lauren said, as much as you know, and trying to to work through all that um, earlier rather than later is very helpful. I think also the engagement with the community early on is is very critical. I think for all of the three Northgate think, uh, stations, Sound Transit has had a, a good um, engagement with the community, and you know, RNA is a, a fabulous example of how we've engaged early and often. I might add something. Yeah, I was just. Uh, oh, go ahead, Jay. Okay. That, um, yeah, I mean, I second uh, everything that's been said to date. Um, but I think having our land use academies was really important. I mean, our own kind of initiation uh, was really critical for us uh, reaching out, and getting a enterprise community partners grant, actually hire some consultants and planners to kind of guide us. Um, one of the earlier attendees, Al Levine, sat on our, uh, you know, our committee as well. So having some people who've seen this process and who could really focus things was important. And then getting the trust of Sound Transit to actually work as partners. We were pretty concerned about just having an open house, three community workshops, and then a final uh, kind of community principles to present to the community. Uh, but we were able to get consistent uh, attendees to the workshops was really critical and having some uh, kind of civic, you know, outside of neighborhood planners engaged in those to kind of add to the information was really important to, to do that in a short period. So thank you.
Yeah, I don't want to, you know, belabor our answer to this question. I guess I was going to say from the TOD perspective, we continue to have con conversations with the Seattle Office of Housing about um, the joint RFP process that we did here and how to think about um, being able to give developers um, more certainty and help with um, the funding that they need to be able to build these big affordable housing projects. And I'm sure, again, Elisa, if you have comments on what would give you additional certainty as an affordable housing developer, feel free to type them. But I think there is just so much that it takes to make these affordable housing projects work. Great, thank you for those insights. I think we have time for probably one or two more questions. So next question, um, child care in TOD is an important feature. Any consideration to mitigate air quality, noise, or heat impacts since children are particularly vulnerable? Yeah, again, <laughs> um, Elisa might have more detail on this as the developer um, of this project. Um, or Kristen, I don't know if, if we uh, partnered or thought about how the station would impact the um, child care facility, but we agree um, we're considering how to partner and provide child care near a number of our stations and our TOD projects. And, um, you know, we think that it's really important. Um, I, I think I'd have to <laughs> ask Elisa for help on, on some of the environmental factors and how they were thought through. I think the only thing I can add is that, I mean, obviously when we designed the station, um, we didn't know that there would be uh, childcare adjacent to it, but the there are event structures that, um, that, are, that we need in order to pull and push air into the underground station and the tunnel. Um, I will say that that was designed such that, you know, air, basically the vents are facing well, so they're facing away from the TOD structure. We knew that, you know, the high school wouldn't be changing anytime soon. And um, with 12th Avenue there, there, there was plenty of room to push, uh, to face our vent structures away from the immediate adjacent development. So, in that respect, you know, Sound Transit did think about during the design of the station, the, the best place to face those vent structures. Um, as far as how that impacts the children, I, um, I can't speak to sort of a specific question about childcare, but Sound Transit does take into account, again, during the design, you know, we, we do have requirements that we have to meet, such as uh, air circulation, um, but we do think about how adjacent uses will develop around the station and therefore how we can design to uh, minimize our impact on those adjacent developments. Great, thank you. So one question that we've gotten a few times now is, Will tenants get transit passes? And I'm guessing this is um, in regards to uh, specifically the development that Mara and Thatcher spoke about. Yeah, so I've been um, a part of various conversations where developers of affordable housing near TOD stations are considering how to provide transit passes and how to um, partner with Sound Transit down the line to be able to do that. To my knowledge, that isn't part of this project. Um, Jay, you might know more, um, or Lisa, um, but I don't think that that is an aspect of this um, TOD. All right, I think we have time for one more question. So final question, of course, now that I posted it, I can't it. 
are there other TOD projects outside of Sound Transit surplus property in the pipeline? Are folks aware of other development? Yeah, so I know that, you know, King County Metro and some of the other um, uh, transportation entities in our region are also thinking about how to um, create TOD opportunities near their infrastructure. And then when we think about TOD at Sound Transit, we think about agency TOD, which is really, you know, um, driven by our surplus property, but also community T TOD, which are projects that happen not on our land, but adjacent to our um, stations and, you know, are still within that walk shed of the station and still have a really important relationship to it. So Sound Transit is definitely not the only um, TOD player in the game. I'll add to that that at U District Station, so Sound Transit owns the, the station, but then the University of Washington owns essentially the air rates above the station and University has hired a developer who is in the initial design phase of building a TOD project actually on top of the U District Station. The, their project, university's project, will be office, um, but it will provide, you know, another TOD opportunity right above the station, providing, obviously, uh, great access for the people working um, in the building. And then at Northgate, as Mara mentioned, King County owns the park and ride that is to the east of the station, and they do have plans to develop that as a TOD project. They are they're in very early sort of discussions about what that's going to be. So I think that's still a project that has quite a ways to go, but eventually that site to the east of the Northgate station will be a TOD site. So um, so yeah, there, for Northgate Link, there are DOD opportunities that both Sound Transit and other entities are taking advantage of and moving forward on. Great, well, we are just about at 11.30, so I think it is time for us to wrap up. Um, first, I wanna say a huge thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I realize that you know, these remote meetings and webinars offer both um, opportunities as well as challenges. So we appreciate the presenters as well as attendees, um, your patience and your flexibility. And it was a great 90 minutes of learning about what's going on and, um, you know, kind of best practices and things that we can continue to move forward. Um, so quick follow up. So we will be following up with an email to attendees. Um, it'll include some of the Juneteenth resources that. Um, were mentioned earlier, as well as links to PowerPoints and some other resources. Um, I also realized that we didn't get through all the questions that were submitted. I wanna say thank you to folks who did submit questions. What we're gonna try and do follow up with submitted questions as best we can. Um, so keep that in mind. And then we'll also have more of this information and resources on the PSRC website as well. So thank you again. Um, enjoy the rest of your Friday um, and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.